Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the latest political news in our weekly update with the Arizona Capital Times. Learn how researchers are working to make solar energy more efficient. And we'll visit the Desert Botanical Garden and the artwork of Dale Chihuly. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The governor today announced that she will not run for another term, a curious pronouncement considering the Constitution prohibits her from serving another term. Here to make sense of it all in our weekly political update is Ben Giles of the Arizona Capital Times. Ben, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, sounds like the governor announce the obvious today. What's going on here? This was not unexpected at all. Um, if you ask just about any attorney in the state of Arizona, they would have told you constitutionally um, even the partial term that Governor Brewer served when uh, she replaced uh, Janet Napolitano, who left for D.C. Uh, any, con any lawyer would have told you if she can't run again, um, but she's been keeping everyone on pins and needles, so to speak, for the last couple of months, delaying announcements about whether or not she was going to try and challenge this in court to see if, you know, and, and today she still said she truly believes if I'd gone to court, I think I would have been successful in arguing that I get another crack at, uh, at re-election. So why didn't you go to court? I, I think that maybe it's just time to move on, as she said, and then as she used the phrase, pass the torch. Um, she's done a lot at the Capitol these, uh, last year with Medicaid expansion and is still trying to do a lot this year, which she made clear that um, her veto pen and or her veto stamp and her pen still have a lot of ink left and she wants to overhaul CPS. She wants to uh, improve education standards in Arizona. And that's going to be a, a, a big load to, to haul at the Capitol this year. Um, so she's got her work cut out for her, but she can still be an influence in Arizona in the coming years, too, because she's got uh, millions of dollars in campaign coffers that now she's not going to use on her own re-election. Last point on this. How did talk of another term even get started when the Constitution seems quite clear on this? Well, uh, I think as we've seen countless times at the Capitol, the lawmakers of, of any variety, be they the uh, representatives in the House or the senators or the governor herself, um, they take a look at the Constitution and they interpret it in ways that they see fit. Um, I sit in Senate Rules Committees all the time where uh, attorneys will raise constitutional concerns about a bill and it is acknowledged and the bill is still voted forward because um, at, at some point a lawmaker will decide we think this is worth a court challenge because we don't quite agree with the interpretation of the mm. Constitution that's widely held. All right, uh, on we go. Oversight ideas for this new child abuse agency. Sounds like you've seen a draft or, or some sort of ideas mm -hmm. floating out there. What kind of oversight can we expect? Um, uh, it seems like a lot more than there is right now. There's been a, a group of lawmakers, um, the governor's staff, a couple of child, uh, uh, a couple of experts in the child welfare field have been making uh, appearances at these weekly Friday meetings in the governor's office where they're drafting a bill to create what they're calling the Independent uh, Department of Child Safety and Family Services. And in the latest draft that we received a copy of from the March 7th meeting, um, the draft explained that one of the things they're considering is creating a, a citizen oversight board, which would include constituents and clients of the department to have a say in the best practices, but also similar to something that the Juvenile Corrections Department has, an inspections bureau that would be charged with ongoing uh, looking at uh, kind of quality assurance issues within the department to make sure that procedures are being followed, but then also to make sure that those procedures are the most effective way to keep children safe and, and, and protect children from abuse. And is the Citizens Oversight Board made up of what kind of citizens? I, I, the, the language specifically says clients and constituents, which I, I believe would mean parents uh, mm -hmm. who have gone through uh, a, a child protective services investigation, folks who, who have real life experience with uh, dealing with cases of abuse and neglect. And I, I think constituents might be some of the um, child safety and welfare organizations in Arizona that are already working to keep uh, children and vulnerable, vulnerable adults safe. Okay, and I think you wrote that the, the draft could be ready for legislative consideration by May 1st. And most folks thought that this was going to be the lightning rod, this was going to be the biggie. If there was going to be a problem uh, this year, that would be it. Now you're thinking Common Core might be? 
could the sticking be. point? Could be. That is, the, that is uh, at least it appears in, in votes in the Senate the last couple of weeks. That is an issue that seems to be splitting the Republican Party in the Senate. Um, there was a bill sponsored by Senator Al Melvin that uh, essentially would have done away with the Common Core standards in Arizona. Um, it was preliminarily approved, but there's one more vote you have to go through in each chamber before uh, before it passes, and it was defeated 12-18, pretty resoundingly on the Senate floor, um, when you had five Republicans vote against it, plus the 13 Democrats who were, who were you know, um, vocally opposed to it. And this is an issue that Senate President Andy Biggs has, has kind of taken a more vocal role in this year. Uh, he's been beating the drum against Common Core. Um, just today, he, he pushed two more anti-Common Core bills for preliminary votes on the floor, and, and they did pass. But uh, I think the expectation, expectation is with this strong backing of Common Core, these new standards, education standards from the business community, that they, they too will be defeated, maybe in a similar 12-18 vote. Well, and again, it sounds like a, a, the, the proverbial tempest in a teapot because the governor is all for this college and career ready standards as Common Core is mm -hmm. now known. I mean, no matter... They can, they can put all the repeals they want up to her desk. He's not going to sign any of those. And that is where there's been rumors swirling about how this could be the Medicaid expansion of 2014, an issue that oh boy. dragged the budget process along into the late summer months and, uh, and kept you know a lot of us here, lawmakers and reporters included, uh, longer here than we wanted to be. We were here until I think about mid to late June last year until the governor finally called a, a special session on Medicaid expansion. And, um, it, it's not really clear, but uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how, how long folks like Senator Biggs are willing to, to drag their feet on Common Core and the budget as a part of it. And we've talked about this in the past, but again, remind us, why is Common Core such an anathema here to some factions in the Republican Party? There is a, a, a narrative of a fear that this is nationalizing, uh, as Senate President Biggs said today, our public education system in Arizona, that, um, that states were basically suckered into accepting Common Core standards when they accepted race to the top funds from the federal government uh, several years ago. Um, yeah, however, there are signs that this is a, a more state-based consortium that is, is pushing these standards. For instance, um, there is an assessment test being developed named PARC. Um, that Secretary, uh, Education Secretary John Hoop, Superintendent, excuse me, John Hoopenthal is a, uh, a governing board member of that consortium. So um, there are signs that uh, this is being developed at, uh, at a more state-based level, but as we heard in the Senate today, there are strong arguments that local control is the best way for education standards and curriculum to be developed. Um, and some of these bills are trying to give local school districts a bigger say in adopting the standards. Well, we will see where that one goes. That sounds like that's got a, that, that one's long uh, from over. Good to see you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. looks at an ASU research team that's studying ways to make solar thermal energy more efficient. ASU Assistant Professor Zachary Holman is helping lead the research efforts. He joins us now. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get kind of fine-tuned here, the Energy Department's focus program, what are we talking about here? Sure, so the Department of Energy has a wing called the Advanced Research, Pro research Project Agency, or ARPA-E. And they're funding a program to try to increase the efficiency of solar power on a, on a utility scale. And uh, there's two main goals. One is to use all colors or wavelengths of sunlight. And the other is to have some storage capability so that sunlight um, 
during the day can generate power during the night. And I, I know that there are two kind of twin uh, research projects going on here. Uh, one, the $3.9 million one is for this high heat photovoltaic device, and that what better converts in sunlight into electricity. That's, that's kind of a parallel track to yours, correct? Yeah, ASU was quite fortunate in winning two of, uh, of 12 awards, and the two awards, uh, the two projects have completely different folk, um, approaches. One, as you said, was to have a, a photovoltaic cell that light is concentrated on, that cell gets hot, it generates electricity and its waste heat um, goes to generating electricity from the heat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the project that I'm working on has, has a, a different approach uh, where we don't have hot PV cells, hot photovoltaic cells, um, but rather we, we try to combine the, the best of, of two existing mature technologies, one of which we call concentrating solar power. Those are the, the big mirrors, um, like the Solana plant down in Gila Bend, and the other is, is photovoltaics. And again, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, I want to make sure I get this right, that you're putting these photovoltaic cells into large reflectors, as we're looking at here, and these reflectors, what, they generate the, the heat and the power, but they also capture, is that, is that what you're working on here? Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the picture that you have up now, these are these uh, large mirrors like they're like down at, at Gila Bend and you can think of this basically as uh, a more advanced version of the lens that a kid would use to burn a piece of paper. Yes. It focuses sunlight onto that tube running horizontally in the middle and you generate a whole bunch of heat there and that heat then goes and powers a, a steam turbine. So this is a conventional uh, concentrating solar power plant and our idea is to uh, integrate photovoltaics which are the um, blue colored things that you see on, on people's roofs or on, on ASU's roofs, for example, into those mirrors. So instead of having silver covering the backside of those mirrors, you'd have photovoltaic cells. What happens then is the photovoltaic cells absorb some of the sunlight and convert it to electricity di directly, and the rest of the sunlight is focused to that, that tube um, at, the, at, the, at the line focus of the concentrator where it generates heat, and then that heat can be stored and converted to electricity at a later point in time. And again, how do you store that heat? I understand that the, the, it sounds like a, a pretty nifty concept there. How do you do it? Sure. Um, heat, it turns out, is a lot easier to store than electricity. Electricity, we store in, in batteries. Batteries are expensive. Heat, um, uh, the, the most common ways to, or a way that's being investigated and, and will be used at the Solana plant is with uh, molten salt. So you actually have very hot um, liquid salts or, or molten salts and think of them just being in a big vat. Think of it being a big thermos, if you will, right? And so uh, you can put heat uh, in there during the day, put this molten salt in, and if it basically acts as a big thermos, mm -hmm. then at night it will still be hot and you can take that heat out, again, run a, a steam turbine and generate electricity from it. So again, it can either be converted or it can be stored, correct? That's right, and stored, again, for the purpose of conversion, but at a later point in time. So the advantage there is uh, a big problem with, with solar power, at least when you go to um, lots of it, which mm -hmm. we're nowhere close to in the U.S., but for example, in Germany, they, they produce all of their, their power at noon on a sunny day from photovoltaics, from, from solar power. And a big problem with that is if they want to add more, they have to have some storage capacity. So this system has integrated storage. And as far as uh, the mirrors, again, this replaces those silver, as you mentioned, mirrors. Th these mirrors are, what, half mirror, half photovoltaic? Is it, what are they, a hybrid kind of a thing here? Actually, it's a photovoltaic that's acting as a mirror to some colors of light. So it, to our eyes, it would just look like basically a black photovoltaic cell. But at wavelengths or colors of light that we can't see, for example, in the UV or in, infra in the infrared, uh, it reflects light. So if we were... Uh, an animal, I think some animals can see in the infrared, for yeah. example, then we would look at it and, and it, would look like, it would look like a mirror rather than, than black to our eyes, black or blue, depending on the exact photovoltaic. So. Interesting. So how, how, uh, how expensive would it be to retrofit some of these mirrors? I'm sure the cost has to be a consideration. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the design we've come up with, these mirrors, these new mirrors, which we call PV mirrors, by the way, are supposed to drop in place of the existing uh, silvered mirrors on plants like Solana, and we expect uh, a cost increase of something like 30%. However, the power output increase is supposed to be 50%. So a uh, cost increase of 30%, power gain of 50%, that means you and I would see cheaper electricity at our homes. And how long, I, I forgot to ask this previous, how long, when you say it's stored, okay, either converted or stored, how long can that heat be stored? 
The Solana plant in Gila Bend is designed for six hours of storage, and uh, our, our new um, system, our new hybrid system, is di designed for 10 hours of storage. So 10 hours after the sun goes down, you could still be uh, um, generating electricity from that stored sunlight. Okay, so, so basically, if you got a full week of rain in the wintertime, which I, we all seem to remember at one time we got here, um, you started getting a little concerned there toward the sixth, seventh day of no sun? <laughs> Sure, uh, that, that will be true of all solar um, power, but um, our, our system actually has an advantage over the uh, traditional concentrating solar power plants like down at Gila Bend. So uh, you might remember from when you were a kid, if you were trying to focus sunlight with a lens, you always point the lens towards the sun. We'd say it's the direct component of light coming directly from the sun that you can, you can focus, right? If you were to point it at some other blue part of the sky, you can't focus enough light in order to burn a piece of paper. Well, the same is true of these mirrored lenses. But since uh, our system has photovoltaic cells on it, and the photovoltaic cells can accept sunlight from any angle, mm. they can accept what we call the diffuse component as well. That's sunlight that's being scattered from the ground or from the clouds or from uh, molecules uh, in the atmosphere. So basically, they can generate um, electricity even on cloudy days, although we won't get a lot of heat yeah. In, the, in the pipe. So no, we do still have some benefit even on cloudy yeah, days. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Now, how far along is this development? We're actually just at the, uh, at the beginning, so things are, are still very exciting. Um, RPE announced the, the awardees for their focus program in February, and we're scheduled for a May 1st start date of our, our three-year project. And so three-year project is kind of a pilot project to see how well it goes? or Absolutely. RPE doesn't fund fundamental research. Uh, rather, they fund things that they expect to transition to uh, commercial products. So uh, by the end of three years, we should have made three different prototypes increasing in size until at the end of three years we have a prototype that's uh, large enough to attract the attention of big companies like Abengoa who installed the, the, the Solana plant. Wow, it sounds fascinating and it certainly sounds encouraging. Uh, good information, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tonight we make a return visit to Desert Botanical Garden and the stunning glass artwork of Dale Chihuly. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana show us how glass and the desert come together at Papago Park. It's called the Sapphire Star. More than 700 blue to clear spires begin the Chihuly in the garden exhibit. The colors are so vibrant. There's no other artist in glass that's doing what Dale Chihuly is doing. What he's doing in Phoenix is generating oohs, ahs, and questions. Well, what's, a, what's a beluga? I guess they kind of look like whales. So do you think it's like this big like, fish hook? Each piece, from this chandelier to the scarlet and yellow icicle tower, is created by a team of glass blowers with final approval coming from Dale Chihuly. He uh, is probably the most successful um, artist to exhibit in gardens around the world. Um, but there is nowhere that he can, has exhibited where he has our plant collection, the beautiful light that the desert has, and then the wonderful vistas and backdrops. It's just a different space for him to see his work. And that's why McGinn says Phoenix is the only garden to host two Chihuly exhibits. The first was in 2008. And we had um, over half a million people visit the garden in six months, which was a record for us. This exhibit features 21 installations spread across 55 acres. Chihuly's signature in every show that I've ever seen, whether it's a fine art museum or a garden, is a boat. Um, he's a collector of boats. And he collects many, many things, but one of the things he's an avid collector of are these um, antique wooden boats. This boat was actually a tender. Um, it dates back to the 1800s, so they're quite fragile when they come. Um, and he loves to put what he calls the millefiori, which is just this wonderful showcase of uh, different shapes and colors of glass into the boat. For more than a year, Chihuly and his team worked with garden staff to pick the best spots. Moving the artwork from Chihuly's studio in Seattle to a canvas in the desert took patience. The glass came in six tractor-trailer trucks over the course of three days. Um, they come in 
hundreds of boxes and each box contains um, pieces of each of the installations. Uh, Chihuly sends a team of 12 down to help us through the installation. They actually do the physical um, installation itself and it took us about two weeks to get it all installed. The Sun was the largest installation. It, it, had, it took the longest to install, about three and a half days. It took a team of five Chihuly installers and it has 2,000 pieces of glass. Some colors and shapes are so striking you can't miss them, like these yellow herons. They're very graceful and they're sitting in the herb among herbs. So as you're standing and looking at the, the piece, you're also smelling lavender and thyme. There's um, a, a chocolate flower. So it's just this wonderful sense, ex sensory experience. Other pieces blend in so well, you might mistake them for desert plants. You could stand here for 10 minutes and watch people walk right by it. But when the sun goes down, McKinn says every piece becomes a star. At night, it's a completely different show. All the sculptures are lit, and we have going up the Garden Butte, we have um, 26 neon panels, so the garden's just glowing at night. Keeping all this glass shiny requires the white glove treatment. It takes about 10 hours each week. The best thing I hear a lot is, wow, look at that. I really love that. Um, but for us, you know, we, we are about being the garden. And to have visitors come in and they'll say, wow, look at that. And then they'll go, and look at that plant. You know, that is really cool. Or I hear often just walking around, um, you know, I, I didn't know this place was here. Or I didn't know how beautiful the desert could be. The Chihuly exhibit runs through May 18th. Advanced reservations are recommended. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, Scottsdale's general plan is generating controversy. We'll have the latest and we'll hear about a drought designation issued for 11 Arizona counties. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.